Howdy folks, welcome to module 3 of the Microsoft MD102 course. This module is called Configuring Profiles for Users and Groups. It consists of only three sections, which we'll be diving into in just a couple of moments. The first section is called Execute Device Profiles. Then we'll be diving into the second section, Oversee Device Profiles. And the third and the last one will be Maintain User Profiles. All right, folks, if you haven't done it already, this is the part where you give the video a like. I mean, I am doing this course for you guys for free in the end of the day. And yeah, there's not exactly a lot of material out there. Putting a lot of effort into it, so the least you can do is at least try and give me a like. If you'd like to know when the other modules for this course comes out or other material, maybe subscribe or don't. doesn't really matter to me. All right, guys, let's go have some fun. Alright, now that I've got my cool intro out of the way, here is the first main section, Execute Device Profiles. First topic in this section is Explore Intune Device Profiles. So Microsoft Intune includes device settings and features that you can enable or disable on different devices within your organization. Now for those of you that don't know this yet, I did mention this previously, Microsoft Intune was originally designed to help you manage phones and tablets that are not necessarily within your office or within your building. Now, it's not the only thing we use it for these days. We also use Intune to manage laptops and desktops, of course. So we can use it to manage laptops, desktops, tablets, and phones. These devices do not need to be in your office. They can be anywhere in the world. As long as they've got a screen, as long as they've got an internet connection, you can manage these devices. And where it gets even better is these devices do not necessarily need to be Windows. Yep, that's right. These devices can have iOS installed on them, in other words, Apple. They can have Android installed, which is from Google. They can have Linux, Unix, or a whole variety of operating systems installed. And you can manage them all from one convenient location, which is, of course, Intune. All right, so this sounds a little bit like hacking. But if I tell you I can control any device from anywhere, anytime, it sounds like hacking. So to prevent this from being such, like I said in the previous modules, the catch is you need to enroll these devices into an Intune environment, which basically is, you can think of it as giving yourself permission to manage these devices. All right, so now we know we can manage these devices once they've been enrolled into our environment. There is many things you can go and do on these devices, some of which we did touch on in the previous two modules. So some of the things you can go and enable and disable um, here's a bit of a list for you guys. Keep in mind, this list is not everything. Absolutely not. The list I'm giving you is simply the list that Microsoft gives. But I can assure you the amount of stuff you can go and enable and disable and configure and tweak and whatever is a heck of a lot longer, folks. So there's a couple for you guys. Administrative templates, certificates, device features. So you can see them mentioning iOS and Mac there. Strangely enough, they don't mention Android, though. Um, I can tell you now, you can actually go and configure device features for Android devices as well. Turn things on, turn things off, tweak things, you know, that kinds of stuff. Device restrictions. So what can your people do on their devices? And this includes phones and tablets. So if you don't want them to be able to do certain things on these devices, yep, that's right. You can go and block them. You can go and prevent them from upgrading to certain editions, or you can actually go and force them to go and upgrade to certain editions. I've seen it's more common to see companies force the users to go and upgrade, and this is normally because they see you as non-compliant. If you're not using the latest edition of a certain, let's say, Windows, it can be seen as a security risk, which means you are at risk, and they don't like that very much. You're causing the company to be you know, vulnerable for the most part. So they can if they want to, and which they probably will, they can go and force you to go and upgrade. You can also go and configure things regarding email, endpoint protection, identity protection, kiosk, VPN, if you need to go and set it up for your users if they're working remotely. I mean, well, let's face it, most of these people are working remotely these days. Wi-Fi settings configuration, custom profiles if need be, which is probably going to be a given if people are going to be working remotely. So that is a little bit about Intune device profiles. We are going to be talking about that a little bit more later on in this module. I mean, the title says profiles for users and groups, after all. 
All right, moving on. Create device profiles. So how the cheese do we create these profiles? How, when, and where? So the platform and profile type determines the options that are available. So it's really going to depend on whether this user is using a laptop, desktop, tablet, or phone, are they using a Windows operating system, or are they using iOS or Android or something else? All of these variables near the, the day will determine what options you've got available when it comes to managing these people's devices and how exactly these profiles get created. Now, in a nutshell, these profiles that I keep talking about, you actually get different kinds. I mean, they don't mention that in the beginning of this course, but I'm telling you now, you actually get different kinds. And the kind they're talking about at this point in time, in the beginning of this course, is the kind of profile that you would go and create as an administrator. And this profile, for the most part, would have a bunch of settings and configurations and, you know, things like that. And uh, you can go call it whatever you want. And the idea here is for you to go and use that profile and apply it to a group of devices or a group of users. So let me give you guys a scenario. If I've got a sales department in my company and there's a certain setting or configuration I would like to apply to all the folks working in my sales department, I can, in fact, in Intune, go and choose a group, which happens to include all these people in the sales department, and I can apply that profile. And that profile will now apply that setting to all the people in the sales department. So in this scenario that I've just given you, that was specifically to the users, but you can do it specifically for their devices too. So you, go, you can go and actually go and create what we call users groups or devices groups. You can call them any name you want, and it works very much the same concept as Active Directory on-premises, folks. So you can assign it to the following Azure Active Directory groups. Yeah, that's right, because we're talking about Intune. Intune is a cloud platform for Microsoft. Where do you find this mythical tool, you ask? Well, it's on Azure, guys. So you need to have an understanding of what Azure is, which is probably one of Microsoft's biggest cloud platforms out there. You need to know what it is. You need to know how to access it. I would say you need to go and attend at least a very basic Azure course to be able to go and use Intune. If you're not familiar with Azure, guys, you are going to struggle using Intune. I cannot encourage you guys enough to go and do some sort of Azure course. Either go do it at a professional institution of your choice, go watch a couple of YouTube videos, go do a free course, whatever, as long as you go and clue yourself up with some sort of basics of Azure. Otherwise, you are going to struggle when it comes to Intune. You're not going to know what you're doing, where to find a setting, where this is, where that is, what this is all about. It's just going to be chaos. Anyway, so you can go and apply your profiles to selected groups. You can go and apply it to all users and all devices, or you can go and apply it to all devices or all users, or quite frankly, what they don't even mention here, you can go and apply it to specific devices and specific users. To be able to do that, you need to go and create a custom group though. A custom group which includes certain users or a custom group which includes certain devices. Um, I'm not aware of an option yet that you can go and use to go and apply one of these profiles specifically to a specific user or a specific device. The only way you can get around doing that at this point in time is to create a group for users and throw in only that one user or create a group for devices and throw in only that one device and then you apply the profile to that group, which includes only that one device or that one user. But very much the same as an on-premises Active Directory environment, where you cannot go and link group policies directly to users or devices. You normally need to go and throw in those users or devices into something called an OU, which is short for organizational unit. Very much the same concept here in the cloud, folks. You cannot apply these profiles directly to a user or a device. You need to throw those folks into one of these groups. Now, if need be, you can go and exclude groups, obviously, as well from this assignment. So if you would like to do that, it is, of course, possible. All right, let's move on. So since we were talking about you creating a group specifically for one user or one device, you know, I suppose this might be because you want to go and customize something. You also get something called custom device profiles, which is, in fact, something covered in this specific module. So here we go, custom device profiles. So Intune may not have all the settings you need or want, and this is going to happen. Intune, yes, it's a very powerful cloud tool that allows you for the most part to do a lot of stuff on people's devices remotely. They don't have to be in the office. 
Even though it's very powerful, there is going to be times it cannot do what you want it to do. You might need something like Configuration you know, Manager. It used to be called Endpoint Configuration Manager. So you might need that. That's more of an on-premises tool. So there is going to be times where you might need that tool, and that might be better to use, you know, assuming these devices are on-premises. Now, what you can go and do, and this is if you're very lucky, or if your client's very lucky, if you find yourself in a situation where you or your client has both Intune as well as Configuration Manager, you can, in fact, go and combine these two. That will be seen as an example of co-management. You can use them both at the same time. In other words, integrate the two of one another. And that would basically give you the benefits of both worlds. And you can manage them both from one convenient consolidated platform. Very, very cool. But we're still kind of jumping the gun here. I'm just mentioning it. So if you don't find, you know, the settings you're looking for on Intune, maybe go look at some other options like Configuration Manager. Now, speaking of custom device profiles, you can create a custom device profile for Windows 10 and later, in other words, Windows 11. You can also create a custom device profile for Android and iOS. Now, what they don't mention yet at this point in time, but I'm safe, I think it's safe to assume that it's going to happen. If you look at other, these other operating systems you get for other devices, you know, like um, I think Huawei has got their own new operating system. It's very similar to Android. Um, they don't mention anything yet regarding that in these courses. But if it's not supported, I think it's safe to assume that it will be supported going forward very quickly because, you know, there's a huge market for that, obviously. There's just too many people out there that's using Huawei or other devices like that. And that's going to pose a bit of a problem, you know, for us IT guys, you know, from a management perspective. All right, now also on the topic of custom device profiles, you can assign the custom profile to an Azure Active Directory group. I'm sure you guys have known that. You can monitor the status of an assigned profile in Intune. So should you decide, hey, I would like to go and assign this profile to this group of users or this group of devices. Now, if you would like to know what the cheese is going on, you know, what's the status of things, you can, in fact, go to Intune and you can go and monitor the status of the whole affair. You can go and check it out. Now, what I don't see them mentioning here, um, or at least not yet anyway, I'm not sure if they're going to mention it later, of course, is generally, from what I've seen, you can only assign one profile per group. Now, we'll see. Maybe they've changed that. Maybe they'll mention it, of course. But I'm just putting it out the top of my head since it's something I'm aware of. You know, just in case you guys run into that problem, you know, where you're trying to sign more than one profile and it gives you some sort of error. The last time I checked, if you're going to try and, mo try and assign more than one profile, it's going to give you nonsense. It's not going to work. All right, folks, that brings us to the end of the first main section of this module. Moving on to the second one, which is oversee device profiles. All right, folks, moving on. Monitor device profiles in Intune. Yes, it's actually possible to go and monitor it. And it would be surprising to me, actually, if we could not do this. There's pretty much not a thing that you cannot monitor these days. There is no sense of privacy. Really, there is none. All right, so when it comes to monitoring device profiles in Intune, Intune provides a graphical chart, well, multiple charts, in fact, and you can go and use these to see just about anything. Now, I'm going to give you guys a couple examples of some of the main things you guys can go and see, but it's obviously not limited to what I'm telling you guys here. So there's a picture on the right. That picture is probably a little bit outdated, so subject to change. Let's just say that. By the time you guys go in there, it's probably going to say more stuff. It's going to show you more stuff. It's going to be more detailed. It's going to be more user-friendly. That's typical Microsoft. They're constantly improving this stuff. I'm not promoting them. I'm just stating a fact. So you can go and, for example, check the statuses of profiles. You can go and see device assignments and the status. You can view users related to a profile, if that's the kind of thing that you want to know. You can go and view per setting status. So if there's a certain setting you just configured and you're not too sure whether that setting is going to cause an issue down the line, you know, whether it's working the way it's intended, whatever. You can go and view that in a graphical chart of sorts. I mean, isn't that useful? I think it's pretty cool. Now, where it's even more interesting is you can actually also see conflicts. There's going to be times when you're going to go deploy a setting, a configuration, or whatever of sorts, and it might not be too, let's say, compatible with certain devices. It maybe it's an issue regarding Android devices. So you push the setting out to all your devices and Android devices are not too keen on the setting. 
or maybe the Apple devices are not too keen on it, or maybe the Windows devices. Maybe it's specific makes, specific models. It can be anything. But when you deploy a setting or a configuration, you can go and view the conflict. And yeah, this will show you profile name that are creating the conflict. So you can go and see exactly which profile name is the one causing the conflict. And this will obviously allow you to go and do the relevant troubleshooting to go and, well, resolve this issue, of course. All right, folks, further moving on. Manage device sync in Intune. So yes, you can to a certain degree go and manage this. Not 100%, but very, very close to 100%. So you can manage settings and features on your devices of Intune policies. I think we've established that much. That's probably one of the main reasons why a lot of you guys are watching this course. And it's probably one of the main reasons why most folks out there are actually using Microsoft Intune. So when it comes to these mythical Intune policies that we can go and use to manage people and devices. Let's call them Microsoft Intune policies because that's the actual name. Groups of settings that control features on mobile devices and computers. Now, when we say mobile devices, we obviously know that's not just limited to phones, that can be tablets, and to a certain degree, that can actually also be a laptop. You know, computers, I suppose, can also be a laptop. So these are groups of settings, and when we talk about these groups of settings, you can create policies by using templates. Yes, there's actually, in fact, templates. These are there to make your life easier, and so you can go and set the stuff up, obviously, quicker without struggling too much. Microsoft is constantly trying to create more things and add more things to make things quicker and easier for you as the administrator, so you don't have to go and struggle. So if you really want to, you can, of course, go and create this stuff completely from scratch, which is not something most of us will go and do. But if needed, it can be done. What most of us will go and do is we'll go and use templates. And if really needed, we'll just go and tweak a couple of things after that template. We'll go and change the setting here, change the policy there. So you can go and use templates if need be. You can go and deploy these settings to devices or user groups. Something I did mention to you guys earlier in this module. So if you'd like to go and deploy some sort of Intune policy, and you do get different kinds of policies, mind you, which I'll mention in just a moment. I'll mention a couple of categories for you guys. Four, in fact. So if you'd like to deploy whatever kind of policy, you need to choose a group. Either a user group or a device group on the Azure Active Directory. Choose a group, deploy the relevant policy, and there you go. Pops your uncle. Now, since I said I'm going to mention a couple of categories, here is... The categories for you guys. So Intune falls into the following categories. The first one is configuration policies. I think the name speaks for itself. These policies are used just to go and do general configuration on your people's devices. So imagine yourself in a situation where your people are not necessarily at the office and you need to go and configure a certain configuration on these people's devices. Not necessarily to go and block or allow them, although that is something you can go and do too, mind you, but it's not necessarily to go and block or allow them. If you just want to go and do some sort of general configuration on people's devices, how the cheese are you going to do that? Well, obviously that's in tune, but more specifically, configuration policies. It's to configure something on these people's devices. The name kind of says it all, doesn't it? Then you get what we call device compliance policies. So these devices that people are using that can either belong to the company, I don't know what you call that, I suppose you can call it a company-owned asset if we want to be fancy, or these devices can potentially belong to, well, the person who is using it. In other words, it will be a BYOD scenario, which is short for bring your own device. Now, either or, you know, whatever the situation is, there's going to be cases where you want these devices to meet certain criteria first to be met as compliant. You don't want people using devices that are seen as risky. So these devices have to have, let's say, Windows installed, or they have to have iOS installed or Android. There's companies out there that will explicitly force their people to use only Windows. Then I know companies where they'll force their people to use iOS or Android or both of those. And this is not necessarily because of security, although that's one of the reasons. It's sometimes because that specific company has got specific settings they would like to apply, but these specific settings only work on Windows devices, or they only work on Android or Apple devices, or both of those devices. Depending on that specific company's unique needs and unique requirements, 
they may or may not force their users to use a specific operating system. And the same applies to the additions and the builds and the programs they've got on. So for device to be marked compliant, you can force them to use a certain build and operating system. Heck, you can go and force these people to go and use an antivirus. You can force them to use MFA, in other words, multi-factor authentication. You can force these devices to be domain joined for crying out loud. The list goes on, folks. And some of these things or some of these settings and options I've just mentioned, they do kind of sort of overlap with some of the other policies to a certain extent. So the next one I've got here for you guys is conditional access policies. So when you or your users, probably going to be your users or your clients users, when they want to access certain resources in the company, they need to have certain settings and configurations on their PC. They need to meet certain conditions first before they can access these resources. So I'm going to give you guys a couple examples. You can go and spe specify conditions like these people, the devices they're using to access these resources, this device has to be Azure domain joint. Now that's a sneaky indirect way for you to force them to use a company device and to force them not to use their personal devices because usually when you try and join a device to the domain, what's it going to do? It's going to ask you for credentials. And obviously, you're not just going to go and give them credentials to go and join random devices to the domain. So a lot of companies are very keen on this setting where they'll force their users or their clients' users to have a device or use a device that is Azure domain joint. Another very popular one, guys, is to force these people to use MFA, multi-factor authentication. You can if you really want to. You can even go and use what we call a geographical lock. Not sure if that's the exact name for it. I call it a geographical lock. So in other words, you are forcing these people to be in a specific location, geographically speaking. Most common one would be to force them to be at the office. So if they grab that exact laptop they normally use at the office to go and do their work, if they grab that laptop and they go home or they go to a coffee shop, you know, in their neighborhood, wherever, and they use the exact same username, the exact same password, the exact same everything. Is it going to work? No, it's not. Because they are now, geographically speaking, in a different location. And you might think to yourself, wow, this sounds like fantasy. It sounds like sci-fi stuff. I assure you guys it's not. So how this works is, most of the time it's based on your public IP address. So as soon as you move different locations, you're going to be using a different internet connection. And if you use a different internet connection, you're going to be using a different public IP address. So it sees you as a different location. Now, for those of you that know a little bit about IT and more specifically about things like VPN, yes, if you are somewhere else like at home and you VPN to the office, which is basically like digitally teleporting yourself to the office for lack of a better description, if you go and do that, would that allow you to bypass the geographical lock? Yes, it would work. I'm not encouraging you guys to go get up to some sort of shenanigans. I'm just explaining a concept to you guys that yes, it would work. Because then you would basically be piggybacking off your office public IP address. So you're kind of pretending to be somewhere where you're not, which is what VPN is in a nutshell. Pretending to be somewhere you're not, and then you can go and access stuff you're not supposed to, and you can also access stuff that you are supposed to go and access. But yeah, we're not talking about VPN here now, are we? Now, as for conditional access, you can also force these people to have some sort of security on their devices. This can be something like uh, an antivirus. You can force them to have a firewall installed or turned on. Force them to have certain security settings and configurations on the devices. That kinds of stuff. So until these people meet these conditions, they will not be granted access. And there's going to be times when people might actually have access to certain resources. And then boom, bam, suddenly one day they don't have access. It is because they did something on a device which now causes them no longer to meet these requirements. Maybe they turned off their antivirus and the antivirus is actually a condition that needs to be met. And if they turn it off, uh-uh. Conditions are no longer met, which means they no longer have access to these resources. And as soon as they turn the antivirus back on and make sure it's up to date, suddenly they've got access again. So that's basically an example of what conditional access policies are in a nutshell. I probably went too far of that, but at least you guys know what it is. It's a very, very popular um, policy. Conditional access and compliant policy is probably the most popular ones. And then a uh, fourth one I'm going to mention, which is not that popular, is corporate device enrollment policies. So where this basically applies to is if you look at something like Android or iOS, uh, generally these operating systems are seen as people with their personal devices. Windows, not necessarily. 
That can be a company asset. It can be a device that belongs to the user. But if Intune sees an operating system that is iOS or Android, it by default assumes this device belongs to the user and that it is basically a BYOD scenario. There is going to be cases where this is not the case. It might very well actually belong to the company, this device. Now, potato, potato, whatever the situation here is, uh, that's what these policies comes down to in that situation. Now, there's a couple of extra things I need to mention to you guys here, but I'm running out of room here. So let me just clear all this up. All right. So still in the category or the topic of managed device sync and intune, that has not changed. When a device checks in, it immediately receives any pending actions or policies that have been assigned to it. So there's going to be times when maybe you have assigned some sort of new policy to certain devices in your organization or certain people. And these people are not online. The devices are not online. They're not connected. They have not synchronized. So in other words, this setting or policy or configuration or action that you've applied to it, it hasn't kicked in yet. In other words. So when this device eventually checks in, it does check in eventually normally, when it checks in, all of these settings and policies and whatever that you've applied, they will apply immediately on that device. Now the check-in frequency, that obviously depends on the platform and the enrollment time. So it's going to depend. You can go and change that, but it does depend on the platform and the enrollment time. Now if need be, this is normally as a last resort, but if need be, the sync device action forces the selected device to immediately check in with Intune. So there is a way for you to try and force that device to immediately synchronize. Now, I've seen this does not necessarily work, though, because if that device really is just turned off or really is not on any form of network at that point in time, it will not work. But uh, if the device is turned on and it is on a network and it just has not checked in yet, that is a way for you to go and force something. So if you have applied some sort of new policy, to a, let's say a group of devices and um, they will sync it eventually later during this day but you need this policy to be applied like as an immediately then you can if needed go and click on the sync force button and you can go and force this thing through of course all right let's move on to manage devices in intune using script yes that's right you can manage things using script and that is no surprise because you can do literally just about anything with scripts these days uh man i wish i was a scripting guru um i know that's a little off topic but i really wish i was i mean i've, I've looked at some of these guys that know scripting like it is english you know they'll go and just do magic of scripting, you know, whether we're talking about PowerShell scripting or otherwise, they just make it look like magic. Now, I know enough to help myself, you know, from day-to-day -day things, but there's been times where I will just look like I know nothing compared to these guys. Anyway, so you can go and upload PowerShell scripts to Intune and run them on Windows devices. Now, they, you'll notice they say specifically Windows devices because PowerShell is a Windows thing here, guys. It's not going to work on your iOS devices or Android. So if you're going to go and try that, don't even bother. It's not going to work. That's what I was talking about earlier. Some companies specifically want their people, their staff, their users to use a certain operating system. It has to be Windows, has to be iOS, or has to be Android. And that's because of their unique requirements or needs. And this could be a situation where this company has a unique requirement to run something like PowerShell scripts. And that now obviously means the people have to use Windows devices. Now these devices, for you to be able to do that, they must be joined to the Azure Active Directory. Well, in most cases, these devices have to be joined to the Active Directory, but I'm mentioning it again to you guys. To run these PowerShell scripts, you must create the script and test it before using it in Intune. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're not just going to go and randomly go and type a script, go and upload it, or go and try and run it without testing it. I mean, that's just nuts, folks. This applies to pretty much anything and everything in IT. It's a golden rule in IT. You go and test something first in a pilot program or something of sorts. Go check if it gives you the desired results, if it does what it's supposed to do. And if you're happy with the results, then you go and do the rest of the stuff. If you're happy with the results and it does what it's supposed to, then you go and upload the script to Intune. Step three, very much like the profiles and everything else we've been speaking of, you need to assign the script to an Azure Active Directory group. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen, folks. So with a lot of things here, not just the scripts, not just the profiles, it's going to involve Azure Active Directory. 
that's going to involve you assigning it to a group of users or a group of devices. So assigning it to a group of containing the devices that will run the script. In this case, it's about devices. Step four, monitor the script execution in the console. Now, step four is probably not that compulsory, but I can very highly advise it. I mean, it's, it's very ill-advised for you to go run a script and just to assume it's going to work. You might argue with me and say, hey, but I've run this script before. I know it's going to work. Or I've done this like 10 times or 100 times before. I know it's going to work. <sighs> you know, Azure and Intune and the cloud of Microsoft's ever changing. And there's going to be times where you've done something like 100 times and today it will not work. It has happened to me more times than I can count. It's happened to me more times than I care to admit. And it will happen to you guys eventually as well. So do not assume something is going to work the way you intend. Even if you've done it 100 times, guys, go and double check it. You never know. There might be some sort of human error that you did. It might be a matter of Microsoft has gone and changed something again without informing us because they're very well known to do that kind of stuff. Whatever situation is, monitor your stuff, guys. All right, that brings us to the end of the second main section of this module. Moving on to the third and the last main section of this module, maintaining those user profiles. All right, so the first thing we're going to talk about here, guys, is user profile. Before I put anything on the screen here, I want to mention something again that I mentioned earlier in the beginning of this module. You get various kinds of profiles. The profile we spoke about in the beginning of this module is the kind of profile you would go and make that's going to have a bunch of settings and configurations in it, and you're going to go and apply that to a group of users or a group of devices. And it's going to go and tweak a whole bunch of settings for a whole bunch of people or a whole bunch of devices in one go. Now, the profile we're talking about right now is not that kind. This is for a specific user. So every user has a user profile that is created when the user signs in for the first time. So you will have one. Everybody is going to have one. It's just going to be a question of when was this created? And that's probably going to be the first time that person signed in, which was probably eons ago. So this is not to be confused with the profile we spoke about earlier. Not the same thing, guys. So the sign-in name is used for the user's folder name. In case you're wondering what that folder name would be, it is the sign-in name. A user profile, you know, a little bit more information about this, contains user state settings, application data, and user data. It is user-specific and personal, so it's specific to that person, Everything that's in there is specifically for that person and their profile. Nobody else, nothing else. It's specific to that person. It is persistent between user sessions. So it doesn't matter if this person decides to go and log in of that profile on another device somewhere else. It's not going to make a difference. It'll be the same profile because it sees, oh, this is the same person. It is persistent between user sessions. And with that being said, it is not computer specific. So very much the same as on-premises on a domain join machine. If you sign in one machine of your domain account and you see your stuff, if you sign in another account, you'll see you can still sign in and see your stuff for the most part. That's assuming you've got something like folder redirection configured. But generally, you should be able to go and sign in on multiple domain machines as long as the same username and the same password and as long as it's on the same network and the same domain. It's very much the same concept. There's a lot of similarities here, and it makes sense if you think about it, because this is Microsoft after all. So it only makes sense that this, this stuff is going to be so similar. All right, folks, but now regarding these user profiles, these ones are now unique and specific to a user, you actually get different types of these profiles, four to be precise. The first one is something called local user profile, probably one of the most common ones you get. So this is a type that is available only on a single computer. So if you or the user is using a computer that is most likely not joined to a company domain, then you or the user will be using something called a local user profile. And um, you know, to add on to that, not that you need to notice, if he or she would have to go and type in a password, that machine would go and check locally on that machine in something called the SAM, S-A-M, it's basically a tiny little database, that contains the user profiles and all that kinds of stuff. It would check in the local machine in something called the SAM if that password and that username is for that machine and if it's all you know legit and all that kinds of stuff. So that's a local profile. The second type of profile we get, which is also very common, also probably just as common as a local one, 
is a profile called roaming user profiles. This is a type that can roam between computers that are domain members. Now, since I said domain members, now you probably know why I said this is also just as common because all companies out there, pretty much all of them, have what we call a domain. And usually in almost all of these situations, you would find their machines are joined to the domain. So a roaming profile is kind of what I said earlier. If I go to one domain machine, domain joint machine in the company, and I type in my username and my password, I should be able to log on. If I go to another domain joint machine in the same company and use the same username and password, it would also log in because that machine, unlike a local profile, that machine is not going to check locally on that machine if that username and that password is correct. It's not going to do that. It is going to contact a central point of authentication, which is usually an Active Directory of sorts, probably going to be an on-premises one. It's going to contact that server. It's normally a server that's got ADDS installed. Not that you need to know that. And that that um, effectively installs the Active Directory software with the user accounts and groups and all that kinds of jazz. Also stuff you don't need to know. All you need to know is this roaming profile is a profile that can be used between multiple machines as long as they're all joined to the same domain. That's it. That's all you need to know for this point in time. A third type of profile you get, which is a little bit rare, I mean, the last two I'm going to mention are quite rare, and the fourth one is one you hopefully never will see. The third one is mandatory user profile. So this is a special type of pre-configured user profile that does not store changes between sign-ins. So if someone needs to sign in, but you don't want that someone's pre-configurations or configurations or anything to be stored on that machine, this is the type of profile. So this is when security is of utmost importance, in my opinion. The fourth one, the last one, one you will hopefully never get, is something called a temporary user profile. So a temporary profile is issued each time that an error condition prevents the user's profile from loading. So if God forbid something happens and the person's unable to sign in for whatever reason, a temporary profile is the one you or the user will be using. This happens automatically in the background. So we're just mentioning to you what basically happens in the engine room, for lack of a better description. All right, guys, moving on to the second last topic. That is regarding the size of these profiles. So options for minimizing the user profile size. So these profiles that we've been talking about so much, specifically the user ones, this last one we've been talking about, profiles contain user data. If you look at your local profiles, I think this is probably going to be the most applicable to roaming profiles. Those profiles contain user data. And as time goes by, and depending on what the user does, this profile can get very large very quickly at times. So size can increase rapidly when users store large files. So if this person happens to work in a line of work where they have a lot of files or large files, before you know it, you blink, boop, the files are getting all over the place. It's going to be a bit of a problem, isn't it? So there's various ways we can tackle this problem. Administrators can limit profile sizes by doing some of the following. I'm going to give you guys three examples. You can go and use something called quotas. Using quotas for user profiles, that is in fact possible, yes. Then redirecting folders out of user profiles. So instead of this nonsense all being stored locally on the machine, you can actually go and use something like folder redirection, if you know what that is. That actually is going to be the next topic, if I'm not mistaken. You can go and use that to store all the data in a central location somewhere, like a server. So this can be like an on-premises server, perhaps. And when a person logs off, all the data synchronizes to that server. And when they log on to any of their machines, it pulls it from that server. So basically uploading and downloading or synchronizing, whatever you want to go and call it. So that's going to mean the profiles locally is going to be a heck of a lot smaller now, occupying a heck of a lot less space, obviously, as well. The third way here would be using the limit user profile size group policy setting. It should come as no surprise because there's over 3,000 settings you can go and configure in your local group policies. So obviously there's going to be something similar to this in there. And yes, there is. Limit user profile size is in fact a setting that you can go and apply. You might have to go and Google where this setting is because like I said, there's over 3,000 settings. So the chances of you knowing where this is is very unlikely unless you happen to have configured this one before. 
So if you don't know where it is, go and Google it. It normally shows you the breadcrumb of exactly where to go in your group policies on your machine to go and configure this. Normally it only needs to be done once. All right, and then you can also store data files outside of user profiles. So, you know, you can go and use something like dedicated shirt folders. This can be, heck, these days, these days can actually be online, guys. You can go use something like OneDrive or something similar to OneDrive. There's no rule that says this stuff has to be on premises. You can go and use dedicated shared folders, which could be something like OneDrive. And then lastly, you can also go and make use of something called home folders if you want to go and use that. Okay, on to the last topic in this section and for this module, deploy and configure folder redirection. Oh, okay, so it seemed I was right with folder redirection. I, was, I had a hunch it might be an end of this module. Wasn't sure if it was end of this module or the next module, but considering we were talking about profiles, I assumed it would make more sense to be in this module. So for those of you not familiar with folder redirection, this is something that for the most part works only on premises. The machines generally have to be joined to the domain. I would not say that as a rule, but generally it works better if it's on a domain. And this allows you or the users to access their data on multiple machines that's on the domain. So usually if you go to a random machine that's joined to the domain, let's say this is your work PC. The PC you use every day for work. Now if you log into that PC every day, sure, you're probably going to find all your files and documents because you use the same machine every day. But what if one day you decide to use a different domain machine? This can be because the other one is faulty, maybe it's too slow, maybe it's too far away, whatever the reason might be, one day you decide to log into a different domain machine. First of all, will you be able to log in? Yes, because they authenticate to the same central point, assuming they're joined to the same domain. Now, second question, will you see your data? No, by default you will not because your data is by default stored on that local machine. Unless you've got something else going for you. Maybe you've got a map drive that you've linked up. Maybe you've got these machines connected to a server of sorts. Or maybe, just maybe, you're using folder redirection, which is the topic here. So once this thing is actually configured properly, you will be able to log on to other domain machines and access the same data. There's a bit of a catch here. Never mind these machines generally having to be on the same domain. It doesn't just automatically replicate between any domain machines. You have to specify, or the administrator at least has to go and do this, between which machines this user profile's data would replicate. So generally it'll only be between, let's say, two, maybe three machines. So maybe someone at the office has got a desktop PC. That's the one they use every day for their general work. And maybe this person also happens to have a laptop. They don't use it that often, but once in a blue moon, this person needs to leave the office, grab the laptop, and when they do that, can they log in? Yes, but they won't necessarily see the same data. So you would like this person's data to replicate between their two devices, their desktop and their laptop. But if, God forbid, someone happens to get a hold of their username and password, and they try and log on somewhere else on another domain machine, you do not want that data to replicate to that machine. And folder redirection does just that. It will not replicate unless you specify specific machines. So folder redirection redirects user profile folders to a network location. Can be used with all user profile types. So local, roaming, and all the other ones. But it's probably going to be roaming most of the time. Content does not copy locally when users sign in. Offline files provide access without network connectivity. So if you find yourself in a sticky situation or the user does, where they don't have internet for a moment or for a while, yeah, this can actually prove useful. Folder redirection is configured by group policy, something I think you guys would have been able to figure out since I've mentioned domains and all of that. So using your group policies, you can go and configure between which machines this actually takes place. So only predefined folders can be redirected. It's not gonna redirect between any machines, just any machines, you have to specify, and it's not going to go and willingly replicate just any folders. You have to specify which folders need to be replicated. So redirection can be based on group membership. So you can go and configure a group policy because, like, like I said earlier, there's over 3,000 policies. You can go and configure a policy that says if you join someone to a certain group, then automatically this folder redirection would go and apply to them. Or you can go and say then it would not apply to them. It's your choice. 
for the redirection benefits. So some of the benefits, obviously not limited to this, is available from any network computer. It is centrally maintained and backed up. So that's why I said it doesn't really matter which machine you go to. It's all going to go and sync to the same machine. Benefits of that is you can go and back up that one machine and then everything is backed up. You can, of course, like I said, you can go and set quotas and you can go, if needed, set different permissions. All right, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this third module of the Microsoft MD-102. Do me a favor, if you've enjoyed it, if you've learned something, if you find this useful, give the video a like. It pushes it out to more people that actually needs it and now more people will actually find this. If you'd like to know when the next module comes out, remember to subscribe. All right, before you guys disappear on me, just the usual shout out and special thank you to the Patreon and PayPal sponsors and all the other guys as well. Those of you that's buying me coffee and milkshakes, those of you clicking on the thanks button below the video, I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Here's the list of some of the Patreon sponsors. Guys, thank you very, very much for supporting me in the channel. Here's a list of some of the guys that's been making PayPal donations. Appreciate you guys. And like I said, I appreciate those of you that's also been buying me coffee. Those of you that's been clicking on the thanks button below the videos. I appreciate you all. Um, if you guys would like to support the channel, you can find that information in the video description down below. So feel free to go and have a look. Speaking of the video description down below, you will also find a Discord server link there. So I might have said this before, but if I have not, I'm saying it now. There is a free Discord server for those of you that know what Discord is. My server is called Free IT Training. It's a community of IT people, which includes myself. It's other people studying IT, some people that have studied IT, and um, they're studying courses exactly like this course. So you, if you've got questions, you can go and ask it there. Someone, including myself, might answer your question. Maybe you see someone else that's asked a question, and maybe you can help them. Either way, the link is in the video description down below, should you be interested. All right, folks, I hope you've enjoyed this third module of the Microsoft MD-102. I'll chat to you all again in Module 4 of the Microsoft MD-102 course.